Hey, what's up? Um, yeah, let's keep looking at logistic regression, shall we? And visualizing logistic regression. In the last video, I identified two problems that I was having with the plots. One of the problems, at least in certain circumstances, was... I forgot. Oh, as you change the bin size, the plot becomes more and more biased. And that seems like a terrible thing. It shouldn't do that. And the other problem was that the residual dependence plots just weren't responsive. So I'm going to investigate these two things. I'm going to start with the uh, uh, the added variable plots problem where the bin size changed things. And Mr. Ash Tordek, Ash Tordek, hello, Mr. Ash Tordek, uh, gave a really good explanation that I'm going to investigate. My guess as to why a larger number of bins reverses or the relationships on the added plot is that when there are few points in the bins, is that when you marginalize for x1 in a bin, the marginalization regresses to the mean. That is, when there are a few data points in the bin, the estimated effect of x1 goes to zero, meaning the variable explained by x1 is not removed. So basically the idea with uh, added variable plots is we are looking at the relationship between x2 in this case and the outcome after subtracting out the effect of x1. But the problem is when we have lots and lots and lots of bins, there's like two data points per bin. And so you get a high degree of variability. So this person is saying that when you got a high degree of variability, that the model regresses to the mean. So even though you are technically subtracting out the effect of x1, because you are binning with so few variables, it, there's this regression to the mean that happens that basically it's like you didn't conditionalize at all. If this is correct, the slope for x2 on the plot where there are many bins should converge to the slope when you fit a GLM with only x2. Very testable hypothesis. So he's saying that if I have a terrible bin choice, like if I choose that there is going to be only two data points per bin, we should see the regression line from that added variable plot coming closer and closer to the slope if you looked at the relationship between y and x2 without controlling for anything. So that is a very, very testable hypothesis. And I think I'm going to start by testing that hypothesis and we'll see what happens. So let's step into R. All right, I'm in R now. Um, going to require the tidyverse and I've changed the name of the function, but still does the same thing. And I'm using the exact same parameters that I used last time to discover it. And I'm just going to make sure that this is a problem that is unique to added variable plots. So logistic overlay. Let's see what that looks like. So that's 1,000 bins, but let's do 5,000. Um, and it's actually not surprising that we see like only three unique levels because if you have two data points per bin, you could either get two zeros, in which case your probability is zero. You can get two ones, in which case your probability is one, or you can get one zero and one one, so 0.5. And that's why you have just three distinct Y values for each of the data points. So that makes sense, but we're not seeing the same sort of bias. I don't think. Oh, I should put this on the logit. So scale equals logit. And what I should see, and then if I go plus geom underscore ab line, slope equals, let's see, I'm looking at the slope of x2, which is 0.25. And then y intercept, I'm going to just put it at zero. See what that does. All right, so it's not bad except for low values of x. Um, but it's not like it reverses directions like it does with the, with the added variable plot. So that leads me to believe it's just a problem with the added variable plot. So let me see that again. So this is when you have a reasonable number of bins, so 10 data points per bin. And it looks like it's doing OK. Uh, let me run another simulation, though, and see if it's consistently pretty close or several simulations and it does seem to be pretty close consistently um, although it does seem to underestimate the slope a little bit yeah because the black line is consistently steeper so the black line is what we would expect the blue line is what we observe the black line is consistently steeper so it's not as strong of an effect and let's see if I change that to 500 and see if that improves things. And again, I'm going to just run it multiple times. That's pretty dead on. Uh, still underestimating, underestimating slightly, very slightly underestimating. More significantly underestimating. Okay. 
So there does seem to be a bias. Um, and let's go back and let's just go the other direction. Just do it super extreme. And we see a reversal. So this person is saying that maybe within a bin, it's not actually controlling for X1. If that's true, let's go ahead and fit a model where you go mod bad, I guess, equals LM Y tilde X2 data e oops data equals D. And then estimate, all right, I'll go, yeah, I'll go estimates, mod, bad. And so the slope is positive. Okay, so I don't think that's the reason. Because we are consistently seeing a negative slope in there. And yet, if we model the relationship between x and y, ignoring, x2 and y, ignoring x1, it's not negative. So I don't think that's it. That was a good guess, though. Um, I actually was very optimistic that that was exactly the reason, but it's not, it seems. So now that leads me to wonder why else? And actually, one thing that I'm wondering about as I'm looking at this, um, if I am really doing 5,000 bins, I'm confused why the y-axis has so much variability. Oh, I know why. Okay, yeah, I know why. Because it's fitting the relationship between X1 and Y, and maybe it's on the probability scale, and each of those values will... Oh, what is that doing? I actually don't know what it's doing. I don't know at what point it converts it. I don't remember what, at what point it converts it to a logit scale. But still, you've got residuals. Let me look at the added variable plot function. Give me just a minute. Okay, I answered one question, and that is uh, why it doesn't have the three discrete bins. That's because what it's doing is it is predicting y from x1, and then what it does is it computes probabilities based on x1, and those probabilities are continuous. They're not a 0 or a 1. So that would be why. Okay, I think I figured out what's going on here. Now, the key is to be able to explain it. Uh, this is going to be hard. All right, so what happens is you end up seeing this banding, and that's very common when you have um, a variable in your model that only has a couple of distinct values. And in this case, what we see is we got an observed logit value because, I mean, on average, each of these groups only have on median, whatever, they only have two observations. So that means we only have a 0.5, a 0, or a 1. Now, in a perfect world, each of these has exactly two observations, but we don't live in a perfect perfect world, so there's actually more than that. But if, I, if you look at what I did here, which is computing the unique of the observed logit, or we could even go just to put it in more terms that are familiar to us. So because we have limited groups, then theoretically, there are only three values it could take, 0.5, 0, and 1. Now, even though I tried to have equal bins per group, it doesn't end up working out that way, and I'm not going to explain why that is. But for some reason, there was one bin group that had more than two people, and it ended up having an average of 0.689. So what does that mean? That means that for every individual, their observed proportion is going to be one of these four values. Essentially, it's a categorical variable at this point. Now their fitted proportions are continuous. If we go hist uh, bin underscore data dollar sign fitted underscore prop, then we have a continuous distribution. Great. Problem is, when we are computing the residual, we're always subtracting these continuous variables from one of these four options. So what tends to happen is that if you have several people who have the same X values, like right here, if they have identical X's, X1's, their predicted probability is always going to be exactly the same because our previous model had only one variable and it's a function. So there's always going to be one predicted value per X value. So everyone with the same X1 value is always going to have the same predicted result, but they could have one of four observed results. And so that's why you see these four 
distinct groupings. Now this ends up being on the logit scale and for reasons I'm not gonna go into, the logit ends up having one more category. Um, and I think it ends up like kind of merging with one of these, but anyway, hopefully you get the idea that again, everybody with the same X value will have identical predicted fitted probabilities or proportions. And when you subtract that from one of these four values or five values, you're going to get this step going in. Now, as you increase on X1, their fitted probabilities are gonna go up. But again, whether you're talking about X1 equals zero or X1 equals one, every single person who shares the same score will have identical fitted probabilities. And each time you're subtracting that from one of the same four or five values. So that's why you get this banding. The banding reflects the fact that you are always subtracting the same four observed probabilities from one of the fitted values, which are all gonna be consistently the same on X. So that's why you end up getting this banding. And this is something that we know about. Like if you look at a residual dependence plot where you have an outcome measure that is like a Likert scale that has discrete values like one through seven, you tend to get this kind of banding look and on average, it doesn't make a difference. But if it's extreme like this, then what you end up getting is you get a negative slope. Okay, so that's the first clue of what's happening is we got these weird residuals. But remember that X1 and X2 are correlated. So if I go flex plot, X1 tilde X2 data equals bind underscore data, we see a slightly positive correlation between X1 and X2. So what does that mean? That's telling us that if X1 is negatively correlated with the bin residuals, just as an artifact of the binning, then we expect X2 to also be correlated with those bin residuals because X1 and X2 are correlated. And if what X1 and X2 are correlated, and if X1 shows a negative relationship with the residuals, then guess what? X2 is also going to show a negative relationship with the residuals. Whew, I thought I broke math for a minute. Um, so, uh, I feel very good about knowing why it happens. And it just happens. It's just an artifact of binning. Now, how do you fix it? Turns out you don't fix it this week. Yeah, because um, fixing that bin issue is actually really complicated. And I'm not entirely sure that I'm going to continue to pursue that. And the reason why is because um, trying to fix that problem ends up creating more problems, though I'm not quite done working on that yet. And maybe that'll be next week's video. But more importantly, it works unless you do extreme binning. So why bother fixing the issue if you can just not do extreme binning? I don't know. So let me just summarize everything so far. So my goal in this series, which I don't think I'm done yet, but uh, my goal was to try to visualize logistic regression better because a logistic regression plot has binary outcomes. So it's either a one or a zero and a scatter plot of that isn't very intuitive because the dots don't pass through the center of the data, which is how we usually evaluate a scatter plot. And so my basic idea was to bin the X axis variable and compute proportions within bins. And for the most part, that works really well. We get scatter plot like behavior. And then when we extend those to added variable plots, they work pretty well as long as you don't have extreme binning. And by the way, you can do extreme binning for just a regular scatter plot. It worked fine. It's just when you try to do the added variable plot that it became a problem. And the residual dependence plots are still a work in progress. And I have made some progress on that. And I'll give you a foreshadowing of what happened. I actually discovered something about regular residual dependence plots. Um, and it turns out you can break regular residual dependence plots. I didn't know that, but I broke them because I was breaking the logistic versions and I was like, does this happen with regular ones? And it turns out it does. But that'll be a topic for another time. 
But overall, the residual dependence plots don't seem to be that sensitive to misspecification. But fortunately, the problems that we want to identify from residual dependence plots show up elsewhere. So take home message is that the regular logistic overlaid scatter plots, they work really well, surprisingly well. And some of the extensions have some limitations with the with the added variable plots, you just got to make sure not to have bin sizes that are too small. And with the residual dependence plots, uh, that's more complicated. I'll get into that another time, possibly. But I don't know whether at this point to continue to like try to fix the bin issue slash the residual dependence plot issue, because they do seem to be working pretty well. Um, I'm considering that next time I'm just going to start using it and do an actual analysis with real data and see what kind of insights we can glean from these new plots that I've invented. So yeah, stay tuned if you want to see that. And hey, um, I got some classes coming up in August. Some live classes, that is. So if you want to join one of my live classes, see the links in the description. And with live classes, you get to interact with me through Zoom. It's kind of cool. I get to meet y'all. It's great. And if that doesn't work with your schedule, then you could always do a on-demand class where you get to learn at your own pace. These self-guided sort of classes. And they're like a hit. They're, the, they're all the rage nowadays with these young kids and their technology and their computers and their iPhones and their slang that doesn't make any sense. Well, actually, most people who take classes from me are not that young. Now I'm just rambling. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know if you have any questions or comments, and I'll see you next time. Peace out.